Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Melbourne Writers' Festival. We respectfully acknowledge that today we are meeting on the traditional lands of Kulin Nation, in particular the Wurundjeri and Boon people. We pay respect to their elders and to the elders of all communities and cultures across Victoria. Now, my name is Andrew McDonald, and welcome to School Report. In this session, we'll be exploring the unique, diverse, and often unpredictable world of school through the eyes of two very different but equally wonderful characters, Eric Vale and Alice Miranda. Here to give us their school reports are two authors who know a lot about school life since they've both been teachers and students in the past. Michael Jared Bauer was a teacher of English and economics in Brisbane and Ipswich before he quit his job to try his hand at writing. His debut novel, The Running Man, was published in 2004 and went on to win the Children's Book Council of Australia Book of the Year Prize for Older Readers. Since then, he's published nine more books, including Just a Dog, Don't Call Me Ishmael, and its sequels, and now the Eric Vale series, which follows the adventures of the highly imaginative but severely accident-prone Eric Vale as he navigates his way through the fifth grade at Morton Hill Primary School and encounters his fair share of epic fails along the way. Sitting next to Michael, Jacqueline Harvey has worked for more than 10 years in the school system as a primary school teacher and as a deputy head, and up until the end of last year was the director of development at Abbotsley, a school for girls in Sydney. She is now a full-time writer who has written the Clementine Rose series, um, as well as uh, the uh, Alice Miranda series, of course, uh, beginning with book number one, Alice Miranda at School, uh, and the latest in the series, which is, of course, Alice Miranda Shines Bright. Please make a whole lot of noise and make both of these authors very welcome. We're going to be talking about all things school up here today, uh, and a little bit later on, I'm going to throw to you guys to ask some questions of both Jacqueline and Michael, but to start with, we're going to hear from both of these authors, uh, starting with Jacqueline. Again, please make her very welcome. Well, thank you very, very much, Andrew. It's wonderful to be here. I should start off by saying it is afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, you know, we are in school, so that's how we are. You know, I know you're expected to address your teachers like that. It's very true that I actually have worked in schools my entire career. I really never left school. I went to school, went straight to university, and went straight back to school. It's suffice to say that I love the school environment, and, uh, and I knew from an extremely young age that I wanted to be a teacher. However, it wasn't always that way. You see, when I was nine my life changed quite dramatically. My dad came home one day and he said, uh, I need to have a serious talk with you. Now, if your dad says something in that tone of voice, do you think you're in trouble? Yes. I thought I was in trouble. I thought maybe I'd forgotten to feed the dog. Maybe I'd forgotten to put the rubbish out. No, no, dad said, no, you're not in trouble. He said, your mother and I have made a really big decision and it's going to affect you. And I thought, oh, what's going on? And then he said, uh, we've decided to sell the house. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, won't we just buy another house? He said, yes, of course we will, but you don't understand. He said, "Uh, we're moving quite far away and you're going to have to go to a new school. And I looked at my dad and I said, yes! (laughs) And he said, what? I said, dad, you don't understand. I have the scariest teacher in Australia. My teacher at the time in grade four, was about seven feet tall. He had jet black hair that was shiny like crow's feathers and he looked at our class every day like this. (laughs) He hated kids. Now, I don't know what kind of a brainiac wakes up one day and thinks, hmm, what should I be when I make my career choice? Let me think about this. I hate children. Children are the worst scum-sucking horrible little creatures on the face of the planet. What should I be? I've got it. I should be a teacher. Now, I think he became a teacher purely with the idea of being able to torture children every day. And torture us he did, because when I was your age, actually when Michael was your age too, I'm sure it wasn't against the law to hit kids at school. This teacher of mine used to like to do it all the time. So if anybody in our class did anything wrong, like look sideways at the person next to them, He would say, right, you out the front now. The kid would come trembling to the front of the room. Their knees would be shaking. Their teeth would be chattering. He would march to the corner of the classroom where he had a very special cupboard. He would open up that cupboard. 
he would have a little look. He would pull out one of his special weapons and he would always do this with it. That poor kid standing in the middle of the room would be shaking like a leaf. He would say, hold out your hand. The kid's hand would come out like this. And he'd say, flatten your palm. And then he'd whack them across the fingertips. Not once, anything up to six times. Now, I was terrified of getting the cane from Mr. Watson. So when my dad said we were moving, I thought, yes, I couldn't possibly get the second scariest teacher in Australia. And you know what? I didn't. I got a woman who I considered to be the best teacher in Australia. She was funny, she was clever, she could sing and paint and draw and play the piano and the guitar, and every day in her class was an adventure. And by the time I had her for a whole end of fourth class and all of the next year, I knew I wanted to be a teacher just like her. But I was also one of those kids who, now let me see, Who here goes home at the end of quite a few days at school, at the end of sort of each day, and your mum and dad say to you, so, what did you do at school today? Who can tell me what the most sort of regular answer, which is probably the least popular answer with your parents or your teachers? Nothing. (laughs) I did nothing. Do you know, teachers hate that answer because no teacher in the history of the world actually goes to school and plans nothing. (laughs) It just doesn't happen. Your parents don't send you to school to sit there and do nothing. Anyway, I was never the kid who'd done nothing at school. I was always the kid who had a story to tell. Often the stories were courtesy of some of the kids up there. In fact, that's me there. And the boy standing just above my left shoulder, he provided lots of stories for me. Because that boy, for whatever reason, when I started school in the middle of fourth grade, he decided from the very first day that he was going to marry me. (laughs) Sadly, I didn't feel the same way about him. (laughs) And for pretty much the next two and a half years in primary school, I'd be out playing with my friends and we'd be in the playground walking along and I would feel this sort of breath on my shoulder and I'd turn around and go, what? And he'd go, (sighs) and I'd walk away again and I'd be there again, I'd be like, what? like, ah. I tell you what, it's funny for maybe a week. It's not so funny after that. So anyway, I knew for a long time that I wanted to become a teacher and I thought it would be cool to be a storyteller too. Now, I did take a big giant leap of faith at the end of last year to become a full-time writer. And my character, Alice Miranda, has kind of been inspired, I guess, by the fact that I've worked in schools for such a long time. And I've also worked pretty much my entire career in boarding schools. So I just want to tell you a little bit about Alice Miranda's school world. So she has rather a long name. Her name is Alice Miranda Heighton Smith Kennington Jones. She's the product of her parents, Cecilia Heighton Smith, and her father is Hugh Kennington Jones. Her mother's side of the family, they own the most enormous department store chain in the world called Heightons. Her father's side of the family, they own the most enormous grocery store chain in the world called Kennington's. When they got married, it was touted as the world's most magnificent retailing merger. And so her parents didn't know what to call her, so they called her everything. When she starts at her new school, she, I wanted her to have a best friend with whom she would instantly have something in common. Now, it didn't have to be their age because Alice Miranda goes to boarding school when she's only seven and a quarter. But I thought, what else could they have in common that would be sort of funny? So I decided that Millie could have the same number of names as Alice Miranda. But Millie's name is ridiculous. Like, you think Alice Miranda's is crazy? Millie's is much worse. Do you know it off by heart? Can you say it really loudly? You are a star. Give her a clap. Well done. Woohoo! There is Millie's name, Millicent Jane McLaughlin McTavish McNaughton McGill. But you can just call her Millie, and that's all she gets called through the whole series. And then there's this girl, Jacinta Headlington Bear. Now, she looks a nice enough girl, doesn't she? You know, sometimes looks can be deceiving. Now, I'm just going to check the time. How are we going? Good. Good. I thought I might introduce you to Jacinta the way Alice Miranda gets introduced to Jacinta. But in order to do this, I need a volunteer. I need a really, really good volunteer who's not afraid to ham it up in front of... Yeah, you've got your hand up. You look so confident. What's your name? 
come out the front, Alex. Did I pick someone good? Yes. Okay. So, Alex, actually, sweetheart, how about we, we might go down on this level. This could be good. Actually, we might go to this level because I don't want... There's a potential for injury in this. <laughs> so, so, actually, I just need to quickly brief her on what she needs to do. So, don't listen. Actually, can my mic go on for, off for... Okay, mic back on, wonderful. So, just sit there for one second, um, Alex. Transform, do a, do a transformation, start thinking like Jacinta, okay? All right, so what happens when Alice Miranda gets to school on her very first day? She arrives and for a start, I have to tell you, she's actually booked herself into boarding school early. She's not supposed to go until the next year, but she telephones the school and she then tells her parents afterwards that she's arranged it. And she says to them, look, you're so busy, I'm very happy to be at boarding school, and then when I come home at the holidays, it's like a big holiday for all of us. And so even though they cry a lot, they let her go. They know there's no point stopping her. She gets to school, and on the very first day, she's, she's arrived, and the headmistress's secretary comes running out of the school office, and she says, oh my goodness, Alice Miranda, there must have been a mix-up with the letters, and you're a day early. Her parents say, well, that's no bother. We can take her home and bring her back again tomorrow. Miss Higgins says, no, 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 that's a terrible inconvenience. I can look after her until the rest of the children arrive. So she takes Alice Miranda off to her boarding house, Grimthorpe House, where she unpacks her things. She, um, she then is allowed to go for a walk around the school and have a bit of an ex exploration. Now, this is one of those schools that looks amazing, looks perfect. It has everything. It has swimming pool, tennis courts, a sailing lake. It has pony paddock. But from the minute she gets there, she thinks that something doesn't feel right in this place and she can't work out what it is. Now, she meets three people on her exploration. She meets the school cook, Mrs Smith, who is having a good old cry in the kitchen. She then meets the gardener, who's having a big old temper tantrum in the greenhouse. Then she meets the only girl who is at school at the time. And her name is Jacinta Hedlington Bear. Now... I'm just going to read you a little bit, and Alex is going to magically transform you. Just sit there to start with, sweetheart. Okay. Passing by the gymnasium, Alice Miranda heard a piercing scream. She ran towards the open door and saw a young girl about 11 years of age squealing with the might of 10 elephants. Alice Miranda sat down beside her. Hello. My name's Alice Miranda Hyten Smith Kennington Jones, and I've just come today. Who cares? The girl spat. Leave me alone. But you're upset. Alice Miranda reached out and patted the girl gently on the arm. Don't touch me! <laughs> then the girl did the most extraordinary thing. She jumped up and she ran down the gym mats, tumbling and twirling. We're going to pretend this bit. <laughs> we don't need any injuries. <laughs> Alice Miranda. <laughs> My goodness, Alice Miranda exclaimed. Stop, stop. Stop there. You're the best tumbler I've ever seen. Mummy and Daddy once took me to meet a Russian count and there were tumblers there, but you are so much better than they were. The girl took off again, tumbling backwards over and over. Now you can come back to me, Alex. Alice Miranda clapped and cheered. The girl stopped. She strode over to where Alice Miranda was sitting and stood in front of her. Put your hands on your hips, stand up. My name is Jacinta Hedlington Bear, she declared with her hands firmly on her hips, and nobody likes me. Well, I can't understand why. You're simply the cleverest gymnast. Why don't you tell me what's the matter? Give Alex a big round of applause. That's hard to do off the cuff. Well done. So, anyway, Alice Miranda's kind of not like every other child I've ever met. And in fact, if I'd have seen that, ah, I think I would have looked in the door and gone, there's a very scary girl in the gym. Back away. Back away slowly. Okay, quick. Don't make eye contact. And I would have run as fast as I could to find a teacher. But that's not Alice Miranda's way. She's really unusual. And I suppose one of the things that I love about Alice Miranda is that she makes friends with everybody. And instead of looking at what is pretty much bad behavior, 
she looks past the bad behavior to find the person underneath. And she always looks for the reason for the bad behavior. So Great. I think I'm going to leave it there because I don't want to hog all the time. And Michael and I have got so many slides and so many fab <laughs> things to show you. So um, that's a little tiny introduction to Alice Miranda. And uh, can I just say the funniest comment that I heard about her last year, I was on tour in South Carolina in America and a little boy put up his hand, he was busting to say something. He said, ma'am, that girl, she does not normal. <laughs> and I thought, I'm good with that. <laughs> okay, Michael. Thank you. There's that for you. Stop. Hi, everyone. It's amazing when uh, Jacqueline was up here speaking about her school days, so just sitting there thinking how similar we were when she was talking about all that caning, it brought back all these memories to me. <laughs> Luckily, I was a perfect child at school and never, ever got into trouble. <laughs> and then I remembered how many times I was walking across the playground and I had all these girls trailing <laughs> after me, going, oh, isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> never. <laughs> I love words and stories when I was at school. I used to love reading. I used to love making up stories more. So obviously, when I was uh, in primary school, what I wanted to be when I uh, grew up uh, was a samurai warrior. It was my goal in life to be a samurai, and I realized that at school, even at school, I realized it was probably unlikely I would be a samurai. So I had a backup plan. If I couldn't be a samurai, I was going to be a ninja. <laughs> the two things I wanted to be, samurai and ninja. And I wanted to be those two things because there was a TV show on when I was a boy about samurais and ninjas. And it came from Japan, and the hero was a samurai called Shintaro Osikusa. Oh. And he was my hero, and he used to hang out with good ninjas, including his sidekick called Tombei the Mist. And they used to fight the bad ninjas. When I was at school, I never thought about being a writer, but I thought about being a samurai, and I used to practice to be a samurai. I came home from school. I would turn on the samurai TV program. I made myself a long wooden samurai sword, the worst sword you've ever seen in your life. Got a big bend in the middle of it. Got a handle nailed on with one nail. Rocks back and forth, falls off. I sit in front of the TV. I watch Shintaro the samurai and Tombei the ninja fighting the bad ninjas. I study their sword fighting moves. After the show finishes, I go to my backyard up in Ashgrove in Brisbane where I come from. And then I run yelling, screaming and leaping across my backyard, attacking our clothesline with my samurai sword. <laughs> And I become very skillful. And at school, I didn't actually write stories, unlike uh, Eric Vale, who loves making up stories and writing them down. But I used to make up stories in my head. How many people here ever made up a story in their head? How many people ever put yourself in that story? When you put yourself in the story that you make up in your head, do you put yourself as one of the people at the back of a crowd somewhere? Or do you put yourself in as the hero? Hero? hero. Yeah. I used to make up samurai stories. Like grade three, I'd imagine myself walking down a dark alley at midnight in grade three. <laughs> what am I doing there? I don't know. But luckily, I have my long wooden samurai sword with me. And I walk down the dark alley, and as it gets darker and dingier and scarier and gloomier, I get towards the end, and suddenly, I get attacked by a wild gang of clotheslines. <laughs> <laughs> and I can fight them all because I've been practicing in my backyard. I went on to want to write stories. My character, Eric Vale, uh, he's in grade five and he loves writing stories. He's got a, uh, he gets in trouble sometimes because he's supposed to be paying attention in class and he's trying to write his stories. Anyone here ever got in trouble for not paying attention in class? Oh, really? <laughs> So all the bad kids came here today, did they? <laughs> Eric's got a secret agent character called Secret Agent Derek Danger Dale. And he fights his nemesis called Evil Doctor Evil McEvilness. What do you think he's like? No, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> he's just got an unfortunate name. No, he's an evil guy. Here's the thing about every story I've ever written has always started off with something really tiny. The only reason I wrote three Eric Vale books and really enjoyed doing them because I got to do them with my son Joe, who's the illustrator, is because I made an epic fail myself. 
Not really an epic fail, more a tiny fail. One day I was going to type something on my my daughter Megan's Facebook page. She lives down here in Melbourne. Um, And I was going to tell her that something that I had done hadn't worked out properly. And I was going to say it turned out to be an epic fail. And I typed it in and I sent it. And I didn't realise instead of typing epic fail, (laughs) I had typed Eric fail. (laughs) I didn't notice it. But my daughter Megan notices all my mistakes and she never let me forget it because she's a horrible person. (laughs) Luckily, she's not here today. She'll be here tomorrow. I won't say that bit. And she used to say to me, every time I made a mistake or did something stupid, which was quite often, she would say to me, oh, Dad, is that another Eric fail, is it? (laughs) See how hilarious she is? And it made me think of a boy called whose name sounded like Epic Fail and I made up the name Eric Vale. And I started to think, What if he gets that nickname because his name sounds like that phrase? And he doesn't like it, of course, because it's a terrible nickname. And he thinks, all I have to do is not do anything wrong and people will forget about it. But then because they call him epic fail, all these epic fail things start to happen to him. And then he decides, I have to have an epic win in order to get rid of this name. And so that's the way the uh, story developed. I wrote the story with my son, Joe. That's my son, Joe, there. Uh, He's a young filmmaker. He's a great artist as well. Actually, he looks a bit weird in that photo because Joe is uh, growing his hair sort of for a roll. He normally looks like this. (laughs) (laughs) Although he was feeling a little bit sick that day. Normally like this, more like this. No, he's a normal boy. He just sits around the house doing normal things. (laughs) Anyone here love drawing? Joe used to love drawing when he was a kid and he loved it his whole life. And he used to have uh, lots and lots of exercise books where he would do little cartoons of often plays on words, things that he would interpret in a different way. And I always wanted to write something with him where he could do the illustrations. Joe designed all the characters for uh, Eric Vale, Epic Fail in the series, all the kids in the school, uh, Evil Doctor, Evil McEvilness, Secret Agent Derek Danger Dale, uh, a lot of the other characters. And these are the two main characters in the story. Uh, Eric Vale, uh, very creative boy, loves to do his drawings, often gets into trouble, and his good friend, William Rodriguez. (laughs) William's got a nickname called Chewy, Choo Choo Rodriguez. And he got that nickname because one day in class they're doing a crossword puzzle, and the clue is a type of train that carries cargo. And the answer is supposed to be freight train, But Chewy thinks he knows the answer. Henny jumps up in class and says, I know, miss, choo-choo train. And he gets the nickname Chewy Rodriguez. Chewy's the most positive person in the world. He believes in everything because both his parents are motivational speakers. (laughs) Every year at the athletics carnival, Chewy enters the high jump. He thinks he's going to be high jump champion. He's the shortest kid in school by a million miles. But every year... He's positive he can do it. And every year, he hasn't jumped high enough yet to hit his head on the bottom of the bar. (laughs) He always goes under the bar, unfortunately. But Chewie's really positive and optimistic. Eric gets his nickname, uh, Epic Fail, and he wants everything to go right, but things start to go wrong. First thing that goes wrong is they have a big school assembly like this, and Chewie and Eric are performing on the school assembly. They're acting out a part from a novel that they're doing in class. And they're wearing lapel microphones. And after they do their little acting out bit on stage in front of a whole school assembly like we have here, they're supposed to sit on stage with the rest of the teachers and the visiting speakers. And their teacher, Mr. Winter, says, make sure you turn your microphones off and don't misbehave when you're sitting on stage because everyone can see you. Concentrate and do the right thing. So they do their little performance. They do it. It goes okay. Eric sits down beside Chewy. Eric remembers to turn his microphone off. Chewy forgets to turn his microphone off. And his microphone is right here on Chewy's shirt. They've got a guest speaker for the day. It's the lady mayoress, a lady called Doreen Dorrington. And she talks And she talks, and she talks, and she talks, and she talks. 
And Eric's getting a bit restless and distracted, but he says, you know, I have to sit quietly here because everyone can see me. And she's talking and talking and talking and talking. Eventually, Eric cannot stand it any longer. And he turns to Chewy. And he whispers out the side of his mouth, but unfortunately right into Chewy's microphone. I think they should call her Mrs. Borington, <laughs> not Dorrington. She should say, hi, I'm Deputy Mayor Boreen Borington. I bore dead people. <laughs> Chewy twisted up his mouth so he wouldn't laugh. And then something strange happened. All of a sudden, everyone in the assembly hall started talking and laughing right in the mis- middle of Mrs. Dorrington's speech. Talk about rude. Someone was going to be in big trouble. I looked over at the principal and the deputy and Mr. Winter. They seemed pretty upset. They were looking around trying to find out what caused the noise and making angry bulldog faces at everyone to get them to be quiet. I leant down and spoke out the side of my mouth to Chewy again. What just happened there? Did Mrs. Borrington bore someone to death? (laughs) Suddenly everyone starts killing themselves laughing again. What's the matter with these people? (laughs) Don't they have any manners? I leant across again. Hey, what's the bet? that Mrs. Borrington, when she was at school, she was a boarder. <gasps> More laughing. What's going on, Chewy, I reckon? Check out Mr. Winter. His hair's red enough already. If his face goes any redder, I reckon he'll explode like a tomato. <laughs> now everyone's cracking up and they're doing something else. They're all looking in my direction. Some of them are pointing. I look behind me to see what they're pointing at. There's nothing there. Weird. I turn back. I look around the assembly hall. They're laughing even harder. Then I see Martin Fazbender. He's slapping Tyrone on the back with one hand and he's pointing at me with the other. His mouth is making word shapes and the word shapes it's making are epic fail. And so poor Eric goes through a number of epic fails and in the end he has to have an epic win in order uh, to overcome his nickname as a drawing Joe did of us writing the books. I hate that drawing because it's too realistic. (laughs) But that's how he did it. I used to type the story straight onto the computer. Joe would sit on the back of my chair and reach over my shoulder and do the drawing straight onto the screen. He found that was the most efficient way to work. (laughs) What? Anyone believe that? No, that's stupid, isn't it? I was the one who sat on the back of the chair. Joe sat in the... (laughs) Uh, we worked together, I wrote the script, uh, Joe did the, uh, the cartoons and it was a great joy for me to be able to write about Eric Bale, uh, Epic Fail and Eric Bale Super Male when they have a superheroes week at school. Eric's got a superhero like I had the samurai and I love ninjas so Eric's superhero is a new superhero, is a combination between nuclear powered robot and ninja, he's called the nuclear ninjarator. And Eric thinks he's going to be a superhero at Superheroes Week, but things go pretty bad. He ends up being a super zero for a while. And then in the third book, Eric Bale off the rails. Chewy borrows a book from the library. Never go to the library. It's a terrible place. Things can happen there. Eric borrows borrows a book from the library. It's about aliens. And he thinks everyone's an alien. They get a replacement teacher. Chewy thinks she's an alien. He wants to do tests on her to find out if she is or not. Eric has to try and stop him. The thing that Eric Vale learns about the things that go wrong, and I've had some epic fails in my life. When I was grade four and I wanted to be a ninja and a samurai, I became an altar boy at mass, an altar server, and I passed out on the altar eight Sundays in a row. (laughs) So I've had some epic fails. Eric says, even though you have some epic fails in your life, it doesn't mean that you are one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. We're going to throw to you guys to ask some questions very soon. But before we get there, I want to ask both of you, uh, in both of uh, your books, Alice Miranda and Eric Vale, um, school is a place where you don't have control all the time. You have classrooms, classes to go to. You never get to choose who you're in class with. Uh, How do Eric Vale and Alice Miranda kind of wrestle back a little bit of control in their environments? Do you want to start with you? Um Yeah. So Alice Miranda goes to boarding school and I think boarding school is a perfect environment to create um, stories in because there is probably more freedom for kids in that setting than than in a uh, regular day school. Um, And I think, look, Alice Miranda is a very affable, agreeable character who um, 
she, she has a lot of freedom within the school. So she gets to go out riding her horse and um, gets to have all these kinds of adventures, even though she is confined within a school. So, um, yeah, I don't find the school environment particularly constrictive for her at all. Um, and she loves school as well, which, which always helps. Yeah, it does indeed. Michael? Your description of school there, of, uh, you know, don't have much control and you're told where to go and who you have to be with. That sounded my, li- my life as a teacher to me. Yes. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Eric Vale at school, I don't think he has much control. He, uh, he's not the same per- sort of person as, Alan, as Alice Miranda who can take control of a situation and turn it to her good. So I think he's sort of like the, the victim of what goes on around him. Mm-hmm. And he's the, the victim of, of school and trying to do the right thing, but things not necessarily working out. But what I like about school is that, uh, you know, you're often there with your, your friends and people going through that together. So Chewy's got, uh, Eric's got Chewy Rodriguez. And even though his optimism sort of gets them in trouble sometimes and his enthusiasm, uh, it's still like a support network there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's throw to the audience. All of you guys uh, who are here today to see Michael and Jacqueline, do you have questions for them? Hands up in the air if you do. We've got some roving mics on either side of you, one at the back there, another one on the side there. Uh, maybe the boy, but just behind you in the black? Yeah. Um, did you... I forgot. Forgotten? Oh, oh no. That's okay, right. we've got uh, another question right down the front here. You can ask it. What inspired you to write the books? Um, well, obviously, um, because Alice Miranda is set in a school predominantly, um, there are, I think there are um, probably four out of the, the books in the series so far that are, are mostly set in school. Um, definitely being a teacher for a very long time, I think you meet so many different types of children and, um, and children are a constant source of inspiration. I used to always find that, that I'd be hearing funny things or seeing funny things. And so I actually used to keep a little book of all the funny things that would happen at school. And so, um, yeah, being with kids, that's certainly what inspired me to write Alice Miranda and, and Clementine Rose. Well, like I said, at the beginning, the inspiration was just that mistake I made in getting the name. I had, I had like the title of the book, Eric Vale, Epic Fail. And it just made me think of someone who, who got a nickname and didn't want it and did their best to try to get rid of it. But every time they tried to get rid of it, something would go wrong and everyone would call out epic fail. And I got interested in that character. I liked him as a character. And I started to think about Chewy and, and how they would work together to overcome this difficulty. Um, and I've written a few books in school, including the Ishmael series. And as Jacqueline said, uh, being a teacher, you meet so many fantastic people with so many different personalities. And that's what I wanted to put into the books, you know, so many different personalities, but all fantastic. Great right. question. Thank you. In Alice Miranda, why is she, like, so friendly to, like... Um... Jacinta? Yeah. Um, do you know, one of the things I love about her the most is it's the ability to see beyond the behaviour to the person beneath. And so... Often when people are upset or they behave in a certain way, it's because there's something else going on. Now, what I didn't tell you about Jacinta from that, that, fast, that quick scene that we did, Jacinta's the only girl in the school and she's been there for the entire school break because her parents couldn't be bothered to come and get her. Her parents have this incredible life, globe-trotting the world, and so she's really... She might come from a family that's immensely well-off, but she's incredibly neglected. And so Alice Miranda likes to try and get, you know, to meet the real person and not just see the bad behaviour. And so that's why she's so kind to everybody, because she likes to give people the benefit of the doubt, if you like. And I think that's a really important part of her personality. Question down at the very front here. Um, what inspired you to give your characters their personalities? Um, I, I, I don't know, with Eric, because he was going to be someone who had to, these things would happen to them. I wanted him to have like a, a, a good personality, someone that you could like. And even though, when the things go wrong for him, um, I wanted people to, uh, uh, to feel sorry for him, to hope that he was going to eventually achieve things. But I wanted him the sort of person who wouldn't get uh, too down about things and he'd have, uh, particularly because of his friend Chewy Rodriguez, he'd have like a really positive, supportive friend who'd be able to pick him up if he started to feel down. A bit the same way in the Ishmael series where Ishmael has a good friend called the Raz Man who does a similar thing for him. Question about right yeah. there. Um, how many first drafts did he have? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, when I first wrote Alice Miranda, the very first book, I took about two and a half years to write it because I didn't have any pressure. And I also worked in a full-time job um, in a school. I was deputy head of a, a big school, so I didn't have a huge amount of spare time either. So I don't know how many times I would have gone back and rewritten and rewritten. But now, um, there's all those books that you see out the front there, I've written in the last three and a half years. So, um, well, apart from the first book. And so I have quite a lot of pressure to write quickly. So I tend to be a planner. I plan my stories. I plan the big ideas in my stories. And I generally won't start a book until I know what the ending is going to be. Um, because I don't want to get partway through and think, oh, you know, this is getting to be a bit of a drudge. So, um, yeah, so in terms of now, how many drafts, it tends to be much faster. <laughs> I'll just add to that point there. Uh, I'm, I'm exactly the same as Jacqueline. I, I think about a story for a long time in my head before I write anything, and I have to see the ending in my head that I really like. I like that ending to the story before I type a single word. And I, I don't know the whole story, but I know bits of it, and I know the mm. ending, and I try to work out the rest as I go along. I do everything on the computer, and I make changes all the time as I go along. I usually print it out when I get through one draft, and I read through it and make changes, and I usually do that about three times. It takes me most of a year to write a book. Uh, but I'm not writing every day either. Sure, is a lot of work. Yeah. Question down here. Yeah, down, yeah you. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome while writing the book? The biggest challenge? I don't know. I think the biggest challenge some days is just making sure that you put, your, put yourself in the seat and stay there. <laughs> um, you know, when... I don't... I don't know, lots of people say they have writer's block, but I, I don't know, I, it's not something I tend to have an issue with, but it's more that you can be distracted by other things. So when you're on a deadline, it's a really perfect time to clean out your cupboards and to vacuum the house five times and to do other things. You know, it, it tends to be that you get... Some, I don't know if yeah. you find that too, Michael, that but some days you just, you've just really got to make yourself do it. And I think too, maybe coming from teaching background, you have a job as a teacher, then... You've got bells ringing all the time telling you when you have to do things and uh, when you're at home writing, no one rings any bells and uh, therefore the challenge is to sit down and, and, uh, and make yourself work. The other big challenge about writing, I think, is having the confidence to actually say, I'm going to start and see yes. this through yes. and believing in yourself, even though every day you'll be writing things where you think this is not working, it's not good enough. Having the confidence to say, well, if I keep trying and mm. keep going... You know, I, I can make it better and I can get to the end. And I don't know about you, but I generally get sort of partway through or even to the end. And my husband, is he reads for me. And, um, and I'll usually say to him, it's rubbish. The whole thing's rubbish. <laughs> and he'll say, no, no, I really like it. No, it's not. It's just rubbish. And I, I, I go through this absolute crisis of confidence yeah, right yeah. towards the end. Yeah. Um, and I find that's a real yeah. challenge. Who's here has ever tried to write a story and you had a good idea or a good scene and you try to write it or type it on the computer when you read it back, it sounds terrible. Who's ever done that? I think that's a really good sign because yeah. I think it means that uh, you're writers, which means that when you write something, you want it to be as good as you can make it. The worst thing you can be as a writer is easily satisfied. Mm -hmm. It just means that you want to make it better. Every writer, no matter how fantastic they are, looks at something and says, that's no good, I need to try harder and do something else. Can I ask, was it a challenge for both of you to come up with a big cast of characters at the school? Because when we're actually at school, it's not just kind of friends and teachers that are the characters in our mm. lives, it's mm. the enemies and frenemies yeah. and canteen people and gardeners. Yeah. How did you go kind of like putting together a big cast to make the school seem as real as possible or to kind of like as kind of real life? Yeah, I'm, I, I don't have a problem with coming <laughs> up with characters. If anything, I, I have to pare them back a bit sometimes. I, I tend to want to put everybody in there. Um, and in, in Alice Miranda, one of the things we did to overcome the potential issue of being so many characters is in every book there's a cast of characters in the back. And so, um, no, I really enjoy putting everybody, you know, trying to find a role or... or you know, and one of the things I have the most fun with is finding the names for everybody. Yeah. I love thinking of names for characters. It sounds like you fall in love with the characters the same way that Alice Miranda does. I do. I love, I love my characters. There's so many characters there that you know, could end up with their own... They, they could have their own show because <laughs> I love them so much. I think, you, I think you do fall in love with the characters. and They, they seem very real. I mean, those, the characters in the Eric's class seem very real to me. In the other school story, the Ishmael stories that I, I read, those, those boys that I read, wrote three books about seem very real. Mm. And when I wrote the last book in that series where they leave school and last day they say goodbye to their teachers, 
I honestly had tears in my eyes because it was like I was saying goodbye to these people I would never write That's about again. That's always a good sign. Yeah. But I'm a, I'm a bit of a sook in Yeah, I, I write. I often write and cry at the same time yeah. when I, something's really, you know, my it's husband comes in and says, what's wrong with you? And I'll be like, no, it's a really emotional scene. It's a good writing tip. Make sure you write and cry. Write and cry, yes. <laughs> We've got a question at the very back. How did you come up with the names? Uh, where is the girl? I'm... Right in the back. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Um, the names for Alice Miranda, I, so honestly, I spend a lot of time on baby name websites. Um, I, I cruise the baby name sites. I, um, it depends what I'm writing too. Like I've written a book set in Paris and I've just finished writing the draft for Alice Miranda in Japan. So I've spent a lot of time on Japanese baby name websites recently. Um, yeah, I, I tend to, I also tend to try and find character names that are not necessarily kids that I've worked with or taught Although most recently in Clementine Rose, I have put a naughty boy in the stories and he is a real character from my past. Hopefully he never reads it. Oh, he would love it. He would actually be so flattered it just wouldn't be, you know, it would be funny, so. Uh, names are really important. Uh, these days if I go, I visit a lot of schools, sometimes I, there's a class list of the people in the class. I always look at the names there and see if there's a name that might jump off the page or a, a name that might make me think of a personality. Mm. And I've got a journal at home where if I see an interesting name, I often write it down just in case if I'm yep. looking for names, I might go there. But it's trying to find a name that for some reason suits that character. When you're writing comedy, sometimes you can have names that sort of fit a personality yeah. a bit more than you might do in real life. But names are important. They've, they have to work for you. Yeah. Um, uh, further to that, when I go out to visit schools, sometimes that happens too. And um, earlier this year, I was working in a school in, um, in Southampton in England and this little boy came to get his book signed and his name was Sash and I'd never heard of a boy called Sash before and, and uh, I said, that's a great name. Maybe I could use you in a story. And I said, but would you be a good guy or a bad guy? And he said, oh, I'd be a baddie for sure. And I said, why would you be a baddie? And his sister was standing behind him and her name was Tia and she said, well, she said, he eats books for a start. And I said, Bugs, Australian translation, you do mean bugs, don't you? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I eat bugs in the garden. And so I said, right, Sash, the bug-eating baddie, he's definitely going to make an appearance somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so, I thought you were going to say bugs meant boogers. Yeah, well, that's what I was a bit worried about, the translation there, but yeah. no, like, bugs as in bugs. So. Question, young man um, down there. How long have you guys been writing for in your life? I haven't been writing uh, that long. I was a teacher for a long time. So my, my first book only came out in 2004. So next year will be the 10-year anniversary of that book. So I, I was a teacher longer than I've been a writer at the moment. And mine was 2003. My first book was published. So it's 10 years this year. So, um, but I've only been a full-time writer for nine months. Okay, question up the very back. Have you ever started writing a book and then never finished it? Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, I, I, I haven't, and I think one of the reasons I haven't is that I, that process I have where I think about it for a long time and have to have an ending. I think if I didn't have the, an ending in my head that I really liked and thought was a really powerful or good ending, then I might start stories and not finish them. But so far, every story I've started, at least I've got to the end and finished it. Yeah. Okay, time for one quick last question. Are you writing a book at the moment? Like, Yes, I'm always writing a book. Um, I've just finished the draft for Alice Miranda in Japan, which is her ninth adventure, and I'm about to start writing literally on Wednesday, Clementine Rose and the Seaside Escape. Um, at the moment, I have quite, uh, I have very strict deadlines because I have, um, there will be at least 12 Alice Miranda books and eight Clementine Rose books. Wow. Um, so I know, uh, I know into 2015 what I'll be doing. Um, and I'm very lucky because my husband's very good at schedules. <laughs> so. um, if, if Joe wasn't making uh, films and doing special effects at the moment, he, he's, he can't do any more illustrating for a while, I probably would have written another Eric Bale book. I did write a separate story all about secret agent Eric Danger Dale, which might come out one day. And at the moment I'm writing a, a book for um, teenagers, sort of like got some serious things, some funny things in it. And it's told by a 15-year-old girl. So I'm trying to write as a 15-year-old girl. So that would be a challenge for me, possibly. <laughs> well, I might thank have you. to get my wife and daughter to check it, make sure I don't say anything <laughs> stupid. <laughs> thank you both very much. I feel like going thank back you. and enrolling in school again myself after that. Please give uh, Michael and Jacqueline a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.